to this latest uh, press briefing. It's largely for members of the media as well as members of the public. And those of you who want to participate in the exercise by sending us questions, remember the number to send your questions to via WhatsApp. That number is 256-1023. This is an opportunity for you to speak directly with some of this country's leading health officials as we continue to battle the COVID-19 surge. And today, we have with us Dr. Natasha Sobers Granum, who is a lecturer in public health and a senior lecturer in epidemiology at the University of the West Indies. We also have with us Dr. Joseph Herbert, who is a consultant family physician, part-time lecturer in family medicine at UE, and a member of the BAMP COVID-19 task force. And again with us is Dr. Adana Grandison, first vice president of the Barbados Association of Medical Practitioners and consultant manager of home quarantine and a member of the Isolation and Home Quarantine Committee. We also have, to quiz them, some members of the press. Now, we're going to start off with Dr. Natasha Sobers Granum, because we have a situation here where yesterday we reported 342 new cases of COVID, and we also reported nearly 3,000 people who are active COVID cases. Against that backdrop, therefore, we need to hear from this epidemiologist who back in August projected a worst case scenario of Barbados possibly having as much as 500 cases a day. At that time, there were those who scoffed at it and said, no, that could never happen here. Well, with 342 yesterday, we certainly are in a situation where we have to assess exactly where we are and where we seem to be heading. So let's come to you first of all, Dr. Sobers Granham, and get your assessment of what has happened since your last projection and to what extent we need to reassess where we are. Good morning. Hi, good morning, and thank you very much for having me. Um, <clears throat> As you say, uh, in August, September, we would have uh, estimated 500 cases per day as sort of a worst case scenario. Um, and now we are at 342. There are a few things we need to remember with that. Um, one, the 342 cases are reported cases, right? 342 reported cases. And we know that reported cases tend to be an underestimate of the actual cases in the community. So we can pretty much expect that in the community, when we are reporting 342 cases, new cases yesterday, uh, what's happening in the community is higher than that, at least twice that. Some estimates uh, suggest at least three times that. So the, the actual figures that we report uh, tend to be underestimates of what is happening. So, um, yes, we, we, we have suggested 500 cases in August. Um, but I, I want to show you something because we actually run these models um, continue, every day we run the models because what goes into the models is what is happening on the ground as well. So we look at the model that we would have run in August, and then we also run models now in October. And if I may, because I like to see graphs, if I may share my screen and others can see that screen, uh, I would be very happy. So if you can see the screen, that, that's great. If, uh, if not, so this is this is the September one, let's say. Um, and this is when the, uh, the, so this is beginning January, this is what happened to us in January. So we can make comparisons. Yes, this is when we had our alpha variant outbreak. We had very little activity throughout, and then we had a, you know, a small blip there in July. Then we started to really take off at the beginning of September. And then we would have said that we expect something around the, uh, this is worst case. This high bar over here is actually worst case scenario. And the worst case scenarios suggested 
like 90 for 100,000. Let, let, keep that figure in mind, 90 for 100,000 at that point in time. And that translated into this graph that I showed in early September, I think it was, where we said in worst case would be over here 500, and actually we also said as much as 800 cases per day. But because Barbados is vaccinated, we had the 25 to 50%, we, we anticipated that it would be, you know, more around the lines of 300 to 200 cases. But here, here's the thing about the modeling as well. The modeling that we are doing, these numbers are not just based on vaccination. What we are doing is that we are estimating that public health measures would be put in place and that public health measures would be followed so that if public health measures are not put in place and public health measures are not followed, then we have what we are seeing today, which is beyond the estimates of what we have. So this is the uh, third graph. Remember I told you 90 for 100,000 was what we had initially estimated back in uh, late August, September. Now the worst case could be as much as 150,000. This is where we are at just about 80 or so. That's the worst case. I was at low vaccination, but the worst case for us would be at about 125. What I want you to focus on is that the graph is still rising, but we are almost at peak, but not quite there yet. The graph is still rising for us, um, but we are almost at peak. So we should begin to level off in about a week or so and see these 300 reported cases um, uh, happening. So one take home point, one, our graphs initially were an underestimate because, uh, because the public health measures have not been adequately followed. Um, and so what we are seeing today is actually uh, worse than we had, uh, had projected in terms of the absolute numbers. Um, and we're also saying that at this point we have, we are rising and we expect that, you know, some level of leveling off, maybe in about a week or so, um, or we're coming to that stage where we're leveling off, but we are still, as you can see, the graph is rising. And you can even make the comparison between what happened here in, Jan in March to what's happening here. You can clearly see uh, the differences between the alpha and the delta that we believe is circulating uh, here. So I'm gonna stop sharing now in case there are any questions from that. Um, and any need for clarification, because I can get into the numbers and get a little, you know, too much into it. So if there's any need for questions or clarification, I'm going to stop here for that now. Well, I'll take some questions from, from the media, first of all, before we go on to the other guests. Uh, but one question for me would be, uh, translate all that you said now into um, a specific kind of figure. You said previously the worst case scenario was 500. Now you are saying we are we were underestimating. What does that translate into when you look at figures of that type? Worst case being what? Yeah, we're now uh, thinking closer to seven, eight hundred. Um, but that's again worst case. <laughs> Um, and, and I also want to make the point that worst case is, as I said earlier, is not something that we want to see. It is putting the numbers out there so that people can um, do, you know, put the public health measures in place so that we don't reach them. So the 7800 is not a target, it's a prevention method. You know, this is where we do not need to go. We need to um, do what we need to do so we do not get any worse than what it is now. Um, when, when you I don't think that we will see those numbers, or I don't think we're going to see those numbers reported. Remember, we're not going to be seeing those numbers actually reported. Those are the numbers that would be, uh, so we might report maybe as much as 400 in, in the actual reported cases. We have to remember that that's an underestimate of what's happening in the community. Okay. Um, let's take a question from, from the media. Hey, good morning, Randy Bennett from Barbados to here. Um, based on your research and the trajectory, um, would you be in a position to tell um, to tell Barbadians when we will actually return to a sense of normalcy in terms of the numbers 
obviously pre Delta, we were having 60, 50 cases. And then you spoke about it being leveled, the numbers leveling off. But would you say around Christmas, like before Christmas, we could probably see a return to those numbers? Yeah, so um, that is extremely difficult because right now we are doing 60 day projections. That is, uh, we're in October, we're doing 60 day. Um, uh, now that we are, we are doing 60 day projections. So the models depend on what is happening public health wise and if people are following those measures. But I'll tell you why it's difficult because in places where, you know, you might have no movement, movement restrictions and so on, people stop moving, people follow the advice and so on. Then you see the curve come back quicker. But then in places where, you know, you don't have that kind of restrictions and not, or we're not seeing the public health measures we follow the mask, they're not being worn, then it, it, it causes the, uh, the numbers to be drawn. No, it'll, it'll actually be longer. You can, you can see that in some of the graphs across the Caribbean. You know, Bahamas is an example where we, they had three, four months of uh, an outbreak last year, you know, where, you know, they did not completely do you know, restrictions. Whereas you can see that places that do have the restrictions, uh, you can see the, the graph narrow for them. Right now, like I said, we're doing 60-day projections, and we are pr currently projecting that uh, the number should begin to go down, certainly with the next, let me look at the graph again, within the next month or so, that's what, 30 days, we should start to level off, but we want to get back to that wonderful 60, within that 60 day projection. 60 day projection is still, ha still has us at about 25 to 100,000, which is where we were back in uh, August. Is there a follow up question? Um, yes, just one. So you spoke about the no movement days. So um, are you suggesting then that that may be um, a method that government should use in help to, to reduce the, the, the number of, of positive cases in terms of um, policy? Yeah, so um, I, I definitely mentioned the no movement days because that is a, uh, a public health measure that has been shown to work in the short term. Yeah. Yes. Um, however, I would I would caution us to note that any restrictions that we place on now, uh, especially that those movement restrictions, not going to have an effect for another twenty days anyway, because the the, the measures lie behind the numbers will lie behind the measures. Yeah. So any effect that we play that we put in place now won't have an effect on for another twenty days or so. Um, and we are. Um, yeah, we can have the you normal know, movement days, but our numbers are are quite high. And what the data has shown as well is that restrictions are best in the early um, parts of the pandemic, early parts of outbreak. And I'm I'm really uncertain as to how much impact it will have at this stage. It will, it will have some impact, but it won't have the type of impact that it would have maybe four weeks ago. And, and, it, and any impact no will will lie 20 days. We're not going to see the effect right to it. I'm curious about Thanks. what other measures are available to us apart from no movement days. Um, so the, the public health measures have been, I mean, persons definitely have to mask and you have to social distance. And we've been telling ourselves three feet, but with Delta, it's six feet. So you, you, I mean, you have to social distance. Um, and that is what the you know, movement is doing, really. It's saying to you, stay away from persons so that you will social distance. So if you are in an in a, in a enclosed space, it should be down six feet. Uh, so those are the, the options. The other long-term option, right, for keeping the numbers down and uh, it is, is vaccination. But that's a long-term option. And we can definitely see the, the impact of the vaccination on um, things like hospitalizations and deaths. So you, you would still get an increase whilst we're vaccinated, but we won't see that connection with hospitalizations and deaths, like what we're seeing now, because our system is completely overwhelmed, as far as I could tell, um, with hospitalizations as a result of the high numbers. So short term, you know, movement, social distance, keep six, keep six feet away and you know, for me, I, I like the idea of 
um, of having my home as a civil system um, and long-term vaccination. In your modeling, do you project depth? Uh, we have not, not this model, no. We did back in August, but not this model. Sorry about that. Oh uh, yes, hi, good morning. Uh, Colvin Munzi from Nation News here. Uh, just two questions from me uh, to the Dr. Natasha sobers Granham. Uh, firstly, I, I know that modeling is, is, is rather uh, somewhat a complex science, but in, in layman, layman's terms, could you break down a bit of, of, of your methodology for me um, as to how uh, these projections would have been arrived at, what type of extrapolations okay. you'd have used, etc. And also, um, in terms of what does this mean uh, for our healthcare system, our ability to contact trace, uh, has it now been uh, so far outstripped uh, because of the the numbers that you are you are now putting here uh, to us? Eight hundred is is, is is quite high uh, as a daily rate. Yes. Yeah, so first, the methods, and you are absolutely right. It's uh, yes, a complex science and sometimes difficult to explain, but I'll tell you some of the basic things in the model. One, you know, the virus is going to be multiplying. So we, the, one of the big things that we put into the model is the rate at which it will multiply. So in, um, in January, we would have said the rate at which it will multiply would be for every one case, it will multiply at two persons or three persons because that's what alpha did, that, that variant. And then, but now we are dealing with Delta. So we say for every one reported case, we would expect it to multiply five, I have five additional cases, right? For every one case, we would expect every five additional cases because that's, because that's the transmissibility of Delta. It, 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 for every one case, you get more cases. So the modeling is built on assuming that there's a reproductive rate, we call it, one to every five uh, for Delta. And what we did was we said, well, if this public health measure is put in place, we expect the rate to drop to from, from one to three. And then if this one is put in place, one to two. And then if this other one is put in place, then every one person should produce less than one case. And it is only when every reported case is producing or transmitting to less than one person that you can start to see a fall. So the models are saying that we're still seeing the rise because every one case right now is still producing um, more than one. So every one case is still producing two, three, four. Um, this particular model is saying that for, for every one case, we're producing about four um, to, to three to four cases, so we, we, we do percentages, and we go 3.5 or four cases, depending on what is happening in the country. Right? So that's why it, it, it changes. Uh, so it's, it's, it is gathering up information about the reproductive rate in the country and, and using that to predict what is going to happen next. Is that better? That, that's quite fine. Um, and if you could just, uh, my, my follow-up question as well, if you could just touch on that. Oh, or the co contact tracing. Um, but yes, I, I am not on the ground with the contact tracing to know if it has been outstripped, but I would imagine that it ha must be extremely difficult to contact trace um, for every 350, if you have 340 reported cases, it must be very difficult to contact trace the, so I said that every one case produces five cases, right? But for every one case, you actually have to contact trace about 20 people. For every one case, you have to contact trace 20, because not everybody is going to get the virus, but it is still contact tracing them. So I would imagine that at 350 cases, it must be very difficult for the team, and I'm not on the ground, to contact trace an additional 20 people coming out of that 350. And remember what I said as well, is that 350 represents an underestimate. It is a reported case only. So it's an underestimate of what is really happening um, in the community. And we have at least twice, some things say three times as many that cases, and those are not being contact traced. And they're still spreading it, whether asymptomatic or not. Okay, so we're gonna come back to you. Um, 
Dr. Natasha Sobers Granham. And now we're going to go to Dr. Joseph Herbert, a consultant family physician and part time lecturer in family medicine at UE. Uh, you're also a member of the BAMP COVID 19 task force, um, Dr. Herbert. Uh, what's your area of concern? So I guess we all have a number. Good morning. And thank you for having me. Um, I guess we all have a number of areas of concern, but I've, I've come here today uh, to actually focus on uh, an area that I felt has not had enough uh, coverage, which is specifically about the other impact of, of COVID-19. We think about the numbers that are being reported on the dashboard, uh, the numbers of people being infected and dying from COVID-19, but we, it's important to recognize that this pandemic and the impact that it puts on the healthcare system and the, by straining the healthcare system, having less doctors available to do the normal tasks of looking after people with emergencies and NCDs, less nurses, you know, means that it's harder for people to get care for the conditions that we had previous to COVID. Uh, in addition to that, we have, you know, unprecedented financial stressors and psychological stressors that mean that the lifestyle issues that lead to non-communicable diseases are exacerbated. So how are you seeing that play out as a family physician? So uh, anecdotally what we are seeing uh, in the clinic is that people uh, with that level of stress um, are having uh, more severe or more common uh, psychological distress. We see that people are finding it harder to maintain healthy lifestyles and therefore maybe having issues like gaining weight or not sleeping as well. And, and these things all have an impact, may not be able to afford the healthy food they would like to, to purchase. And then there's the issues of the impact on the healthcare system that people's appointments are being postponed, their surgeries are being postponed. Um, people are, and th I mean, I, I'm speaking from anecdotes, my, what I'm hearing from patients, but uh, patients are sometimes scared to, to seek care because what if I'm exposed to, to, to COVID-19 by, by going in a waiting room? What if the healthcare system is so overburdened that I have to wait so long? What if something happens there? And, and so we have to think of it in, 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 in basically two main ways. One in that people are not able to access care in the same way that they were pre-pandemic. And that means that particularly for urgent and emergent situations that they're not as easily getting hold of that care and the, and the healthcare system under strain means that, you know, we, our specialists are, are sort of uh, diluted. They're not all in the place where they need to be. And in the long term, the inability to, to control your chronic diseases as well and to maintain healthy lifestyle is, is making it such that we expect less controlled chronic diseases and uh, prevention that is not being done as well means that we expect to see over the coming years uh, a, a, an, an increase in the consequence of those things. And, and, and what we're seeing is we have to, to plan for that and do whatever we can to nip that in the bud and address it as best as we can given the limitations that we have. You know, the, it is often said that while the grass is growing, the horse is starving. As it stands right now, how do people go about navigating the system? Because there are so many people who are calling, who are saying, well, I have a problem, but I don't know where to go. I don't know who to turn to. Uh, as, as, a, as a family physician, what do you tell your patients when it comes to trying to navigate the system? Uh, you know, I, I I can't cover up the fact that it's, it's challenging right now um, and, and it, it's hurtful because um, uh, you know what we're seeing is that patients are, 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 are scared um, and, uh, and there's, there's not a perfect solution but we have to do the best that we can and I think uh, things that people can do uh, is to one, make sure you're aware of the procedures that are in place to access the healthcare system. So, for example, the QEH has a hotline. If you think you have an emergency and you need to see, uh, go to the emergency room, they're asking you to call that hotline uh, ahead of time. Uh, know that number, write it on your fridge, so that if you are in a situation where you think you have an emergency and need to go to the emergency room, you call and discuss it with a health professional over the phone and let them guide you. 
by the same token, uh, you know, many patients will have a relationship with a personal doctor, um, and utilizing that relationship as best as you can to reach out to them. Uh, second, after calling the hospital, to say, well, uh, are you, if you're available, can you just guide me on what to do? Uh, and I think you know, having a health professional that you trust to help navigate the system can be helpful. Um, that doesn't mean that every time you're gonna be able to get through to somebody, but I think it's worth trying those things simultaneously. Likewise, if you have symptoms that you think are COVID-19, I think another really necessary and important initiative that government has done is creating a hotline specifically for that. And I'm hoping we can bring up those numbers um, later in the show to emphasize them. So if you think you have COVID-19, there's a special hotline for that so that you can be guided appropriately. Uh, and I think in emergencies, uh, uh, knowing those mechanisms and utilizing them, it's important. In the medium and long term though, because we're talking about prevention and managing your, 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 your health conditions, using your family doctor, or GP or polyclinic, utilizing community organizations that are out there to assist you and, 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 and even buddying up with other people who you know suffer with similar things to support each other and share information and research your condition, be, be as much as an expert as you can at it, it, it is equally important. Um, and if we have time later on, I'd like to talk about how we think the health system can assist in those well, I think measures. you should go into it quite <laughs> right away because you don't have a lot of time for okay. sure. So, uh, you know, in terms of medium to long term investments uh, that we at UE think we need in terms of fighting the wave of NCD um, that are going to follow the COVID-19 pandemic, we, we see a need to invest heavily in, in preventative care at the public health level. And you'll see a lot of initiatives around things like childhood obesity, um, healthy environments in schools, uh, trying to make people aware that sugar sweetened beverages, juices, soft drinks, that these things significantly increase your risk for NCDs. And by transitioning that habit to drinking mainly water, you can save money from those, um, uh, purchasing those things and at the same point, significantly cut down your risk for NCDs. We want to public health measures that are proven to work. We want to stop talking about them and make sure we actually put the money there and do it. And on the, in the primary care level, we've been operating without enough nurses and, uh, health professionals such as dietitians and psychologists. We need those people to, to, to put in place what we call multidisciplinary teams that help empower patients with NCDs to become experts at their conditions um, and to navigate the health system and to make manageable lifestyle changes with assistance uh, that can help reduce the risk. And the evidence is there that these things work. They're, they're best practice uh, for management of NCDs, but because of our staffing levels and lack of investment in those areas, and maybe, you know, from my perspective, maybe we haven't led enough on advocating for these things, but I think that needs to change now. We need to seize the moment and make sure that there is investment uh, and, and planning at this level, not just talking about it, that makes these evidence-based and cost-effective measures. Yes, there's a small cost, but the WHO has clearly identified that many of these measures are actually going to be cost-effective or saving in the long run for the economy. If we invest here, especially for the most vulnerable people in society, it's going to be the best way we can spend money in prevention. And one more question on that. Um, I, I've heard some uh, concern that you don't get enough doctors coming forward. What are the issues there? Doctors coming forward to assist in the whole uh, pandemic exercise. There are some people who feel I, I'm not sure more who doctors, doctors can do more. I'm not sure who has said that, um, uh, but uh, to that end, what he can say is the, that BAMP uh, has coordinated throughout the pandemic uh, a, a volunteer response um, that we have many, many doctors who have given freely of their time uh, to man hotlines, to vaccinate, to do swabbing. Um, we have doctors who have volunteered um, to work within the clinics at the hospital um, coming out of private practice to make sure that we minimize the uh, impact. So there's a whole lot of people who are volunteering and I think we had a, the a Met Prime Minister alluded to a critical meeting a, a week ago where uh, there was a much needed engagement um, from policymakers at the moment how we can actually harness those people who want to volunteer but because of the, the red tape uh, uh, maybe holding it back 
And I think we're seeing that happen now. And I'm very excited that there seems to be a, a strong commitment from government to invest in, in, in whatever we can do to, to bolster up a really, a really struggling healthcare system. And likewise, we had a frank discussion about the prevention aspects that we're talking about there, and there, there's a, a, a you know a, a verbal commitment to do these things. But we need we need more than than words. Uh, we need to see action on NCD care um, because that pandemic was here before, and frankly, it will it will continue to kill more people. And it's just as important. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Herbert. Uh, next, let's go to Dr. Adana Grandison, uh, who is primarily concerned these days with the whole question of home isolation and home quarantine. Uh, how has that been going, Dr. Grandison? Good morning, everybody, and thank you, David, for having me. Yes, it has, it has been a labor of love, I will say this there. Um, but we, 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 we continue to press on, and I want to, first of all, say um, I salute the persons who are working on the ground in the field um, triage team, Ministry of Health officials who continue to plug on and, and do very, very late hours and, and continue to try to serve the people of Barbados. But I want to give you an overview essentially of what is happening in our community as we speak. When I look at the dashboard, I have approximately 2,532 persons in community. So that's 2,532 persons in community. <clears throat> At this point in time, we have 35 persons who are actively waiting to be transported urgently, so they would be collected immediately. And this number keeps changing, even as I'm looking at the dashboard, the numbers continue to fluctuate as we move persons in and out of the community. And there are persons, 247 persons, who will need to be transported within a 24-hour period because we really want to have that physical assessment where a doctor can essentially, um, you know, do more in-depth history taking, be able to provide an examination and really sit down and get that one-to-one -one great detail from that patient. We also have right now in community, 1,084 persons who are safe and, <clears throat> and an additional 534 who are safe and are being actively reassessed just to ensure that they continue to remain safe. We also have 559 persons who have been transported since the start of this program on the 30th of September, and 155 persons at the point in time of contact that are already in isolation. So that is an overview of our dashboard. We do have a few other persons that we have not been able to, to gain contact with them. And we ask persons to, to listen out for phone calls. It may come from a, a number that you're not aware of or you're not sure who that person is call, that is calling. We ask that you still answer your phone because it may be a healthcare professional trying to reach you, to check in on you, to see how you're doing. Um, so I just really want to spend a bit of time, though, Ellis, uh, Mr. Ellis, to, to really highlight what is the process in terms of what persons can expect from the home isolation program. So we have a patient, and it really starts at the point of swabbing. We have a patient who is swabbed. They present to the, the various polyclinics and the gymnasium around the country uh, and places around the country, whether it's private care, public care. But the point is they've accessed care to be swabbed because they're either curious to know their status or someone has stated, you really need to go get swabbed. So they swab. Now, they're only two things that could come out of a swabbing experience. You're either positive or you're negative. The persons who are negative, they are now free to move around unless it is that you are in quarantine and we are asking, and this is dealt with on a case-by-case -case basis, mm -hmm. we're asking you to retest at a later date. But though, for those persons who are positive at the point in time, those persons are the persons that the home isolation team will see and, and when I say see, I mean initially electronically see, let me be very careful and make contact with you. And, and, and then if the need be in terms of what your symptomatology is, we will then reach out to you physically or, or essentially transfer you to a facility where you can be physically seen. So you've tested positive and we've, we now make our first contact. This first contact is made by our Ministry of Health officials, the persons that work within the polyclinic system, our medical officers of health. 
And why we choose to do this? Because the medical officers of health are the persons who, who know you. They're the persons who are in direct contact with you. They're the persons who would have spoken to you at some point in time if you came in to have your hypertension managed, et cetera. You're a lot more comfortable with a lot of these persons. And so those are the persons who are now going to be making that first direct contact with you and informing you. At this point in time, do not be surprised if they also ask you some additional questions and as opposed to just saying, well, you're positive, you can go on your way. But they actually do um, quite a robust job in terms of trying to find out what your comorbidity status, if you have hypertension, diabetes, any of the things that may potentially affect you with COVID, as well as your vaccination status. And, and also the situation in the household. We know that there are some persons in Barbados who certainly are finding this time quite challenging, whether psychologically challenging or financially challenging. And we want to be able to identify those persons to get them the requisite care that they need. So that's the first step. They will then triage those persons along with our HIHQ team, and then it moves on to reassessment. Now the reassessment of the patient, and you can get reassessed in, uh, on several different occasions during your isolation period. So don't be too concerned if it is that you get more than one call, and it is because persons are trying to collect different pieces of information. You may get a call from a reassessment team. You may get a call from a transport team telling them we're coming to collect you. All of these various calls that you're going to get. So it's a lot of interaction that you will get with the team. Um, certainly, in terms of the reassessment, I want to allow persons to know that once you are safe in community, because that's really who we allow to stay in community at the end of the day, apart from the persons who are just waiting to be transferred. But once you're safe in community, it's expected that we will realistically, given our numbers right now, as we speak, as I said to you, we have over a thousand persons who are considered safe within our community. So we want to give everybody a bit of equity in terms of reaching the healthcare system. And so realistically speaking, we will attempt to reassess you and reach back out to you within 72 hours. And so those persons, we just want to check to see if it is that you, your symptoms have changed. If it is that you're still doing well, excellent. We continue to allow you to home isolate. However, if your symptoms have changed, you will now up triage you to get you the care that you need. If your symptoms have changed before we have gotten the opportunity to recontact you, we're asking you to contact the call center. And this is the call center dedicated for COVID positive persons. This number is 536-1800. There are persons there who can answer the questions that you have. It may be a simple query, but if you're having any symptoms, this, here, this is the first point of contact, and then they will escalate it up to get you the requisite care that you need. Once that happens, once your isolation period is coming to an end, you will get a different type of call. And that's from Dr. Brian Charles's team, who's responsible for discharging persons. And there, that team will do an exit assessment, make sure that you're still doing safe and give you any information that you need in terms of how to reintegrate back into the community. So that is very roughly essentially the process and the expectation that you can have. I also wanna make persons aware um, there is, it is not a hardcore days conk, okay, I've stayed in isolation for 13 days, or I've stayed in isolation for 25 days, I need to go. That's not how it works. This is based primarily on a clinical assessment. So we want to ensure that you stay safe because a person, let me give you an example, a person can start off with no symptoms. And on day six, their clinical course changes, they now have symptoms, they're now starting to feel unwell. A lot of persons may not think that they're feeling unwell. Um, in speaking to uh, Dr. Ford, we've heard of persons who say, no, 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 I'm good. But when they present and we take their oxygenation status, we are now starting to notice that that person has diminished oxygenation. And so we want to reassess them and get them the requisite care. I also know that there are a lot of persons who are also very scared to go to Harrison Point or Black Mangala based upon some of the videos that we've seen in circulation. I want to reassure you that that facility is actually the best place on the island for you to get the care that you need. The specialists are down there that can care for you. And more importantly, we actually have the resources specifically allocated to the COVID response. So that's a separate arm of the healthcare system that is being used to address the COVID response only. And so if we need to assess some person, we will allow you to go down there and the team down there will make an assessment of you. 
see that you're well and they make the determination about if you okay this person is now safe to return to community or you know we're really not too sure we want to hold this person for a few days let's monitor and see how they do this is the purpose of that team that's there or they can even escalate care and start you on oxygen and give you the requisite medication that you may need dr grandison i'm going to um, ask you to stick a pin there and invite questions from the media and from the public and if you want to pose a specific question via whatsapp then you can message me at 256-1023 media any questions for any of the three people we have here today hello good morning uh sharika griffith from cbc i have a question for dr grandison uh and, and the covid 19 update dated october 10th there was a report among the deaths of a 60 year old barbadian man who succumbed to the viral illness in the community can you provide a little more details on what would have happened in that situation am i correct in understanding that that's somebody that was possibly in home isolation so I cannot provide any information on that direct case. I know that that person was not in home isolation, I can tell you that. So that person would not have been a positive and died at home in home isolation based upon the records that we have. But in terms of the global information about all of the deaths that goes directly to the Ministry of Health, I know that you would have heard that I, I do a bit of post-mortem swabbing, um, but that is not me having a global picture of all of the deaths on the island. Any follow-up question? Just, just a quick follow-up um, for Dr. Grandison. I was, I was wondering, have there been any reported deaths um, of people who have been in home isolation? Thanks, Randy. That's a good question. We have not had any reported deaths of persons who have entered the program. So there are persons who have died at home who did not even have a, for instance, know their status. And that's why we ask persons to get out and really know your status. I, I see Dr. Sobers Granham, she made a really good point that there are reported deaths, which are persons who have presented and have been tested and know their status. And then there are persons who are actually walking around that don't know their status, but they cannot be added to the total number of persons in community that are positive, but they're out there. And so we have had some persons who had not been tested in what we call the anti-mortem phase or prior to death and they did not know their status and upon death they were tested and were known to be positive and these persons would have been living at home like normal so they're not part of the home isolation program but they are persons who died at home understand the difference i understand so Thanks. so just one just one clarification you said there were 2532 people in the community these are people that are in the isolation program Yes, right. please. Right. So could you give me a, a figure in terms of, because obviously you have to meet certain requirements to qualify for the home isolation program. Could you, would you be in a position to give me figures in terms of the, the number of Barbadians that have applied for the home isolation and those who have been denied or? Well, well we don't really break it down to Barbadians versus one uh, international persons. And at this point in time, what we have done, because we've recognized that there is a huge surge of persons, if that person does not have the, the capacity or capability within their home to safely isolate, we have essentially just moved them out into um, essentially an isolation center. So it's not that they've been denied and we leave them, but we allow them to have care continued, but it will be in a different setting. And I can tell you why that is. There are households in Barbados that may have five, six, seven persons, one bathroom, okay? Now, in a situation like that, and let's say two, three bedrooms, in a situation like that, the, the population density within that home is very high. As you heard Dr. Sobers Granham said, this virus essentially has the ability to infect more persons, especially persons that are in close contact. A lot of persons say, but what really six feet? Think about it as a very, very tall man who's laying down between you and the person next to you. Okay, that's a very easy way to think about it. And if you do, you are unable to have that sort of spacing within your home setting to be able to safely isolate and the non-positive persons quarantining, then we have a challenge. And remember, our duty is really to ensure that the positive persons stay safe and they don't get worse or they don't die. 
but we also have an equal duty to the non-positive persons to keep them safe so that they do not potentially contract the virus. So if it is that a situation arises where there are persons, too many persons within a household, or for instance, the one person that's in the household that is now positive is the sole breadwinner within that household, and they cannot get the type of food, access to food, et cetera, that we would need, there are certain measures that we put into place to either provide them with the food if they can safely space in the home or remove them and send them to an isolation center. So for instance, the numbers of 563 that you've seen being transported and 155 that are already in isolation comprise of either persons who were either red or yellow or persons who we thought that we needed to trigger them as a yellow because of their social setting. There's a question here with yes. respect to home quarantine. What are some of the criteria being used to determine persons' suitability for that program, likewise for home isolation? So right now, the home quarantine program is being handled on a case-by-case -case basis. And the reason for that is we know that the isolation situation is that the persons who are positive is, is, has significantly wrapped up. Now, a decision really was made to handle those persons who have the highest risk first. Because in a battle, you have to always risk stratify your situation because we have limited resources. So we made a decision to essentially handle those persons who were COVID positive first. Now, along the way, we are going to meet persons who are COVID negative who are interacting with COVID positive persons. They're the quarantine individuals, the primary contacts. So those persons are handled by on a case by case basis. The structure that we would have started to educate you and introduce you to where persons can go onto a website and sign up, that is a formal home quarantine program, which we are now starting to hope to be able to move towards that. But we need your assistance in trying to sort of cap off the numbers that we are getting every day. Because if we continue to rise in terms of the cases that we are having in community, we will and realistically have to make sure that all or the majority of our efforts are geared towards caring for persons who can potentially get very ill. Because we know that there's a very small percentage of persons who are in quarantine who will seroconvert and become positive unless they're not doing what they're supposed to do in the home. And I know it's quite difficult because, for instance, in a home, you're with your family. As Dr. Sobis Grant said, she likes to see her home as a safe zone. Everyone likes to do that. But if you're having multiple persons going out to work, going out and you know doing their daily routine it is so easy to have that unguarded moment where you may potentially bring home covid so again anytime that and, and i would suggest this here for anyone anytime that you are in your household and being in close contact with your family members for a prolonged period of time we used to call this magic number 15 minutes but with delta you don't need 15 minutes you know, with Delta, you don't need three feet. It, 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 you know, three feet doesn't work. You need six feet. So we want to encourage persons, even within the home, to wear their mask if they do not have the ability to social distance, physical distance of that six feet, or if you're coming into interaction with your family member, especially those family members who are going out. You know, we have a lot of elderly persons. They're not leaving the home. But there's somebody who's coming in that's bringing the groceries and it's not that they're trying to bring covid to the elderly person but it just so happens that based upon the interaction that they will have those persons are still at risk so even for the elderly population if you have family members dropping off food bringing your newspaper for you those types of things please please put on your mask let's take another question uh, yes, from uh, the media go ahead uh, Colville. hello go ahead yes hi uh, dr granderson um Based on the information provided by Dr. Sobas Branham uh, and also the trend in the rising numbers, has it factored into your permutations uh, a, a, a point in time uh, when basically the numbers coming into home isolation will be pretty much um, overwhelmed based on the resources that you have available to monitor and assess uh, these persons as they come in? And I also have a follow-up question for Dr. Sobers as well, please. Mr. Monzi, that is something that we have been in discussion and talks about. This conversation actually happened up to this morning because we are aware that there will come a point in time, especially given the projections that we are seeing. And if we continue to, to not do, I mean, just the basics, you know, so physical distance, wear your mask, hand wash, 
if you're going to cough or sneeze, make sure and cover your nose and your mouth, these types of things. And, and, and I understand it is so easy to, to have that moment where you say, oh dear, this mask is making me feel real bad. I need to pull it down. Because it's, it's also a psychological component to feeling trapped. And I get that. But there's also the potential for always exposure. But we have had that discussion in terms of what happens when we get to X amount of persons in community where, again, the physical human resource is now being overwhelmed in terms of being able to meet the expectations of persons. Now, we know that internationally, there are some uh, countries that persons who are safe, they don't even get a call back during their period of isolation, right? They're just monitored, they're kept there. If they have to, for instance, uh, have a change in status, they make the call, they notify personnel, and it's only when they become symptomatic and they're having challenges that they reach out. We still want to give that very personal touch where persons can be able to communicate with the healthcare professional to know what is happening. But we are starting to look at that because if the projections are right, we know that we are going to have a lot more persons in home isolation and potentially a lot more persons getting ill. So we want to be able to plan early as opposed to sort of looking back and saying, oh dear, let's run and go and do this now. We want to be able to get to that early. We're not on a limb here. Could you, um, do you have, could you share what that cutoff point might be? No, we have not decided what that trigger is. Uh, we are supposed to hopefully meet either later on today or tomorrow. Um, the three clinical heads of isolation quarantine, and this is both in facility and out in community, so that we, as along with the Ministry of Health, to really make that determination of what is going to be that trigger, because you need to have a trigger in place. You had a question um, for um, Dr. So Sobers Granham as well. I did have a question for Dr. Sobers Granham. Uh, basically, based on the extrapolations that you would have pointed out, um, we are still at a point where uh, one is spreading to, to three or four. And as you would have explained, that is based on also a, a, a factored on uh, the measures that are, are currently in place. Um, so if, if I may be blunt in asking, are the measures currently in place enough, uh, so given the fact that we are still having uh, one in three or four uh, infections uh, per person that is positive? So are they enough to, um, to slow down the pandemic? That's what you're asking. Very correct, Dr. Sobers. Okay. Yeah, so the, the measures that are in place um, have not so far slowed down the uh, pandemic. So I would very much be in alignment with BAMP and BAMP's recommendations that say that we should have, you know, movement days and a little bit more restrictions. I have BAMP has already said um, that, you know, places like bars should have smaller numbers, places of worship should have smaller numbers. So I would say, yes, that the, the, the restrictions that we have in place are not sufficient to slow it down um will it uh, but i will also recognize that um the movement restrictions have uh, because i'm a doctor i'm going to say side effects and so it has other effects that we uh, might not want some uh, economic effects but also ncd effects that dr herbert spoke about um so we recognize that full you know lockdown like what we had before is not likely to be uh, to, one it's not likely to have the effect that it did before and um, it's likely to have some negative effects that we don't want, side effects that we don't want, things that Dr. Herbert spoke about. But we should be going one step further at least. BAMP has outlined uh, what these steps are, and I'm in full alignment with what BAMP has outlined in terms of you no know, uh, movement restrictions, in terms of smaller numbers at bars, uh, and BAMP has outlined those things. Where are you on and the I question want of, to make a, sorry, go ahead, proceed. Uh, I, I do want to make the, uh, the plug also for um, vaccination. Vaccination is, is not going to stop the pandemic today or this current outbreak, but um, long term, that is the only way we're going to get out. Because the reason why the lockdowns will not work or will work less now, they, they, they will work, but they'll be less effective now is because we're so fatigued and we're not likely to have the, the type of um, compliance that we had earlier. But long term, the countries that have done well uh, in this pandemic are the ones that um, 
our high vaccination rate, like Cayman, we don't even have to go too far to find Cayman is at 80% vaccination. And there's an increase in cases, just as we are, but no increase in deaths. Same thing with Angola, increase in cases, no increase in deaths. And that's where we need to get to in terms of the long-term way out of the pandemic and vaccinate so that we can start to treat this, like how we treat um, the, the, the flu. You catch it, but because you're vaccinated, no hospitalization, decrease the chance of death. Dr. Sobers, Granham, what are your thoughts on the safe zone concept? Yes, yeah, so um, I'm not sure about all the details of the safe zone concept, but I do um, like the idea of the safe zone concept. Like we've seen it in Trinidad, uh, we've seen it in Guyana, um, and uh, I do I do like that idea because I like the idea that if you are if if you want to say that you know vaccination is my choice, then you will also have the um, rights and choices come with responsibilities. And like I said, I want to create a nice safe zone around my home so that only the work the people that are coming to my home are vaccinated persons, and I'm also staying three feet within within uh, distance. We've seen it work in Diana. Diana has. Uh, so, so we can't go to gyms, we can't go to movie theaters and so on. Um, I don't know what we are going to do. So far, I've only seen hospital places, which is fine. Um, I think we absolutely need to start there. But I would even extend the safe zones, like I said, to gyms, movie theaters, places where people go and congregate and uh, are, are at risk uh, of getting the vaccine. So I like the idea of the safe zones. I'm de definitely on the side of the safe zones. Um, they've, they've I've seen them in Guyana and Trinidad, and I heard one guy tell me last week, oh, uh, you know, if I, if I was in Guyana, I would have had to get vaccinated because I like to go to movies and you can't, or uh, she said also he likes to go to KFC. So he would already have been vaccinated because um, uh, things. So I like the idea of safe zones. Um, and I also like the idea that we are protecting the people who come into those zones because they started with ICUs. And we have to make sure that we are protecting the vulnerable. When somebody comes into hospital with a heart attack, we don't want them to leave um, the, the Delta uh, virus. So I like the idea of the same zones. And to Dr. Grandison, um, this person says, if a person is in isolation at home, um, how could they not go back into the community if nobody is checking on you? And this is a, a persistent complaint coming from people who are at home. I've been home X number of days and nobody has come to check on me. What am I supposed to do? What are those people supposed to do in those circumstances? Dr. Grandison. So, so there are some persons that we are aware that, for instance, have been at home prior to the official launch of the home isolation program. A few of them on a case-by-case -case basis where they would have thought that it was essentially safe for them to stay at home. Um, what we want to ask persons, especially if they are um, now symptomatic, first of all, or they need emergent help, to call 511. If they need emergent help, that's the first thing. If it is that they're having mild symptoms, they have questions, they can actually call the HIHQ call center, which is the number that I would have given you, so that that information can be escalated and passed on to the discharge team especially if you have had at least 14 days you, at home. You need to explain um, what is HIHQ. <laughs> sorry, home isolation. And you asked me this morning because I've gotten so, so, so comfortable with just using abbreviations to just get through things quickly. Home isolation, home quarantine. Um, so if you've passed more than your 14 days at home, we're going to ask you to reach out so that we can have that exit assessment done for, for you because we know that Certainly, if you've been asymptomatic and, and you've had a very good clinical course up to this point, then most likely you are fit for discharge. Um, the other persons who are not in that time period and essentially you are still waiting, we ask that you continue to be patient with us, but you will get someone to reach out to you. But I do know um, Mr. Ellis has been passing on those messages when you do send them to him. They are getting to someone, and there are some persons who can actually tell you, yes, Dr. Grandison sometimes personally has followed up with some of these persons, along with other members on our team, to really try to ascertain where you are in the entire process and to ensure that you are you continue to be safe. But the, the direct number that they should use is, again? 536-1800. And we want to encourage 
own, I know that persons will end up calling that are not COVID positive, but we want to reserve this line for persons who are COVID positive that need help. The, uh, the, the original 536-4500 for COVID queries, that's for anything related to COVID, but we want to have a special line for those COVID possible, positive persons who need to get the help that they require as quickly as possible. Another frequent question. I have a relative coming in from abroad and I want to know whether they can quarantine at home. So at this point in time, um, given the fact that, as I was stat stating, the home um, isolate, the home quarantine program um, really has not been put in place for persons who are coming in, who may have, who may wish to uh, quarantine at home. It is not going through the official channels. And what we want to say is that those cases are going to be handled on a case by case basis. And you are asked to please, please email uh, the CMO or the deputy CMO, so that's CMO at Barbados at health.gov.bb or DCMO at health.gov.bb. And remember that because of this, because we're using very, um, we're using the resources that we have to be able to do the duty that we need to do best, that we will be allowing persons who come in and simply want to go home to quarantine in the period on a case by case basis. And they, it will, we will need to continue to do that in order to ensure that we keep everybody safe. Let's take another question. From the media. I have one for, for, for Dr. Granderson. Um, to what extent have you been able to distribute the thermometers, pulse oximeters, and the ankle bracelets to those in home isolation? So the pulse oximeters, uh, thermometers, and ankle bracelets are only distributed to persons who are green. Why green only? Green are the persons who are staying in community. We know that we are getting persons who are red and yellows who will be essentially up triage and transported out of the community. So you will have that job being done for you quite nicely by a healthcare professional. So you don't really need to do it yourself. Um, so we have gotten out to um, over, I want to say up to yesterday, I believe our numbers were just over 250 persons as it relates to the ankle bracelets. However, there is a small subcategory of persons that we are actually putting ankle bracelets on and it has to do with one, the age profile of persons. Persons who we believe that one, are safe, so you, you need to be a green first, that's the first thing. But certainly the, we've noticed that some of the young persons, uh, and when I say young, I'm talking about from 18 to 40, um, are you generally the ones who at least start off quite well. And when they start off well, because they're usually a lot busier in community, they may feel as if they're missing out on the good things that they do, although they're quite limited now, but the good things that uh, society still has to offer. So they're the ones who we've noticed are still potentially breaching isolation, and we don't want that. So we have uh, made a decision to essentially equip those persons with a monitoring bracelet, because at the end of the day, we would prefer um, that you have on a monitoring bracelet versus spending $50,000 for a year in prison. We don't think that at this point in time we need to be penalizing anyone. So we want to help you to not actually break the law. Well, let me come back to Dr. Herbert. We haven't heard from him for quite a while. Because to a large extent, people are so preoccupied with the immediate. And that perhaps um, puts in perspective the challenge that you and others are going to be facing in trying to deal with the non-COVID side of this. How do you see it? Oh, and I think that's just human nature. We are often uh, obviously focused on what our most immediate threat. Um, but on the flip side, we know that prevention, um, you know, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Um, and uh, and you know, we've been talking about NCDs for a couple of decades now. Uh, and I, uh, there's an analogy that, uh, that Dr. Kenneth Connell uh, shared with me about hurricanes. People, if a hurricane is coming, uh, everybody is stocking up, getting ready for that hurricane. But he likened NCDs to be, to be like a very slow moving hurricane. Uh, every day, uh, people are dying from uh, heart attacks and strokes and suffering from 
uh, other NCDs, we think of uh, mental health as an NCD, and that has a tremendous uh, impact, anxiety and depression and other mental health disorders. And the fact is that there are some very simple uh, measures we like to think of as being low-hanging fruit. Um, the WHO calls them best buys because uh, leaders and thought leaders have researched and proven that these sort of measures can significantly reduce the burden uh, of NCDs on individuals. And we all know how uh, diabetes and heart disease and mental health affects us because we've lived it either ourselves or somebody close to us. And also as a society, um, uh, you know, successive, uh, successive governments have, have recognized how NCDs uh, affect us as a society and, and, and potentially, uh, to quote David Thompson, I think said that it could erase the, erase the gains that we are going to make. Likewise, the present government has made strong commitments. But at the same point, we seem to have a bit of inertia in moving forward. Uh, and that's, you know, human nature. But recognizing that in the same way, when we thought that perhaps COVID-19 could never do this to us, that we had measures in place, um, the same thing has happened. You know, it has come here. And uh, we need to learn from that experience and plan ahead for what is well recognized among experts as, uh, as going to happen. The, the later wave of COVID, so to speak, is going to be that uh, increase in NCDs. And if we invest in these measures now and, and, and bolster our polyclinics to do prevention uh, the way it's been recommended within clinical guidelines um, and monitor that progress, make sure we're doing it correctly. And you know, we actually have UE uh, members with, with uh, liaising with international partners have researched how to do this. We, we actually have models for how to do this effectively. We just need to put those things in place and track them. Likewise, at the public health level, making sure that we move ahead with food labeling so people can choose healthy foods uh, easier, making sure that we make it more affordable for people to, to choose those, buy those healthy foods, and at the same point, uh, make sure that people are aware of what foods are unhealthy, making sure that we reduce salt in foods. Um, and we make schools safe and workplaces safer environments from the perspective of the lifestyle things that lead to NCDs. These are things that are incredibly important that will reap us uh, significant rewards individually as families who suffer from the plight of these conditions and also on a population level. Um, but it takes uh, uh, foresight and action uh, to, and planning to make those things happen. Uh, so uh, that's my plug today. Thank you very much, Dr. Joseph Herbert. And let's hear the closing comments coming from Dr. Natasha Sobers Granham, the epidemiologist. So my, my closing comments um, will be twofold. One, I want to encourage those persons who are primary contact or think that they may have the virus or out there who have not come forward for testing to come forward. Um, those persons who uh, you know, who are out there, they're sick and they know they have it or they, they might have an idea um, and they haven't come forward because, you know, we don't want what Dr. Granison spoke of to happen to you. So there are those who are out there who have not come forward and we'd like to um, encourage you to do so. And, and the second thing I'd like to say is, um, you know, make a, a huge plug for vaccinations. Vaccines are safe and they're effective and they are our long-term way out of the pandemic. And they can help us, uh, you can go on and see, they can help us to break the cycle, be the cases, so we can have high numbers of cases without having hospitalizations and deaths that we are having. So I want to encourage people to get vaccinated. I want to encourage people to come forward to the testing. And if by chance you're not vaccinated, please come forward even more for testing so that we can get you uh, um, any help that you might need nice and early. So vaccinations and testing, those are my final thoughts. And thank you very much for your update as well. And the final word is yours, Dr. Adana Grandison. Thanks a lot, David. Um, I just really want to encourage persons, if they can, essentially to, to try to, one, first of all, follow the protocols, because that's what we really need to do. That's, that's where we really need to start following the protocols. Um, and I, I understand that sometimes you feel that and, and that you need to speak to someone 
whether it's going to start at the level of a friend or your primary health care professional or your church pastor or reverend or you think that you may even need intervention at the level of a healthcare professional, I want us to start to normalize that because we really, really need to take care of our mental health. Two, I want to say to the persons, as Dr. Soper has said, I can't plug it enough. We really need to get out there and know our status. If you recognize that you have symptoms, it is something that you wake up this morning and say, wait, hold on, something just doesn't feel quite like how I normally feel. And you have that little tingling feeling, the spidey senses go off in the back of your head and you're wondering, could I possibly have COVID? If that question enters your thought, then I want to say to you, please go out and know your status. Early testing, early intervention saves lives. The third thing that I want to say is to those persons who are specifically staying at home and home isolating, we want you to start to also separate what you call your biohazardous waste from normal garbage. We want to keep our, even our uh, garbage collection uh, personnel, uh, sanitation services guys uh, and ladies, you want to keep them safe as well. Um, to those persons who will be staying at home just now, you will also be seeing that you will have a special um, vet and a, a garbage bin, put that special garbage in because we want to ensure that it is appropriately. Um, for those persons again who have been at home for a long period of time, or you ha you are positive and you have any questions and you want to know something, please call the home isolation home quarantine call center. That number is five three six one eight zero zero. And lastly, if you're at home and we call you for reassessment, please, please, please be honest and accurate about what you say to us in terms of how you are feeling. We want to be able to help you. We don't see the, the Harrison Point and Black Mangala as a prison to toss you in. It is a facility to provide you with the care. I can tell you that, that personally, Dr. Corey Ford does not like to lose a single patient. And if it is one group of doctors that I can be sure of that give it their all in terms of trying to assist you 24 hours around the clock once they are on, it is those doctors and other healthcare professionals, nurses, everyone who makes up that part of the team down in the various isolation centers to assist you with the clinical care that you need. So if we think that, for instance, you are at increased risk, and sometimes we may flag you because you're not having symptoms at this point in time. But for instance, your NCD profile or your comorbidity profile is such that we may think that you may deteriorate. Or based upon what we're seeing in terms of your positive test, we think that you have the potential to get worse. Or based upon your home situation, we know that it is not ideal for you to be at home. We have a duty to care for you. And that is what we will do each and every single step of the way. Thank you very care much. Care for you and care for your family members. Thank you very much, Dr. Donna Grandison. We also extend our thanks to Dr. Natasha Sobers Granham and Dr. Joseph Herbert. And of course, to you, the viewers, and the members of the media, as well as our production team. I'm David Ellis.